contract. And hopefully then we <laughs> extend the things uh, that is called more house, that is a relation between CNRS and uh, and and the SIC. And uh, actually this is why they are here uh, this week. Uh, so it's a team of uh, I think five people. Uh, <laughs> we are five. As they will be our trying to go to go to Paris too. So <laughs> this is uh, the nice thing of the SIC. I mean uh, well just to give you some background, um, Renault is a geographer, this is a geographer. Yeah, bitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it may be true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, he's the history professor at the Paris Interos uh, now. And you are the director of Reality. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> the equivalent to FISC uh, mm -hmm. in either, yeah. no? Yeah. CNRS. CNRS, yeah. Uh, yeah, Paris Interos. And well, he got the, the PhD in. Uh, is 2004, I think, or not? That's three. Ah, no, this is uh, Metricon, yeah. yeah, 2003. Um, and after that, you have been Metricons in uh, University of Paris 1, Pantone. Yes. And uh, then after that, you, you went to the to Paris. Paris in Rome, five years ago. Uh, he has visited many, many universities, and also he has some, some uh, prizes and some awards in there, <laughs> for what I see. Uh, <laughs> but I think that, I mean, at least on, on what I see seen in your uh, in your background, you have been working in real estate also in the US. No? Yes. So this is nice because you have like a very different view from the one in Europe. Uh, yeah. is, is uh, quite different. So well, I mean, I think that what he's going to do to present is something related to, to housing as a market. That is what we are working in, in more housing probably hopefully in the next uh, year. Next program. So, well, Thank, you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, today, uh, so we're, we're very happy to to, to visit you uh, for this first uh, uh, formal meeting for the More House project. Uh, so with Thomas, uh, Thibault, <laughs> Julien, and Marc. Uh, so we are five. Um, so my presentation will be twofold. Uh, first part, uh, I'll introduce a more theoretical framework uh, to explain to better explain what we are doing with property price and property data. Uh, and actually, we're not very much interested in price. Uh, we're not doing pricing. Uh, we're trying to understand the real estate market more as a system. Uh, so I'll present uh, a theoretical framework on that. Um, and uh, we, uh, illustrate uh, the theoretical framework using two papers, one submitted and one published, uh, to give you some insights of what we are doing as a team in the main research program I am coordinating on wealth inequalities and the dynamics of housing property markets with uh, fields research in France, uh, in cities like Paris, Avignon and Lyon, and in other cities in Europe, which is what we've been doing together uh, in, with the ESPON program. And in the second part of the presentation, uh, I'll go through some of the results and problems that we had uh, with the ESPON program that involves uh, mostly uh, matching uh, heterogeneous and uh, databases together uh, to analyze property prices in Europe and produce harmonized indicators uh, on property markets. Uh, so uh, I shall start. Um, and uh, so in our research group, mostly we investigate social spatial inequalities induced by inflation uh, in housing markets. Uh, our goal is to provide what we call an empirically grounded uh, theorization of social spatial inequalities uh, derived through something which is called housing finance regime that I will explain a little bit later. Uh, and uh, we bridge together two approaches uh, one is uh, political economy of markets um, and uh, how agents organize on the market and how the market and the price is in fact a social product and not exactly the point where demand and offer match together. And on the other side, we do that with a special analysis uh, to uh, ground the analysis. Um, so I start with this slide because it's been published last month uh, I mean, in September, uh, in a newspaper in Paris, uh, it's a problem where you have the price per square meter in Paris going uh, over the 10,000 euro per square meter threshold, uh, whereas the interest rates uh, have been decreasing 
uh, throughout the, the period uh, during uh, at least the last decade or at least during the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, our concern uh, is focused on the dynamics uh, produced by a continuous increase in property price and a steady increase in home ownership. Uh, it's in fact a paradox that while uh, the property prices have increased, uh, during the same m period, the uh, percentage of home ownership has also increased. So inflation does not stop people from buying properties and from moving from renters to buyers, um, which is a, an interesting paradox. Um, so since the mid 90s, uh, housing prices have increased faster than the income of buyers, uh, digging a gap between those who can afford and those who can't afford, um, not to mention for some households, some vulnerability, for instance, indebtedness that bear access to, to the market. Um, uh, basically, uh, at a European level, uh, housing price has become uh, a, a major factor uh, of social inequality, um, and uh, it's a figure from Eurostat, uh, it, just, it just says what it says, uh, in 2014, 7% of European population faced a situation where housing costs accounted for more than half of their disposable income. Uh, we discussed with Matthias this morning that some, in some places here uh, in Mallorca, uh, the price of rent is the average uh, inc monthly income. So you know what it means. Um, so there is an affordability crisis. And this affordability crisis uh, is a shift towards what we call uh, uh, an asset-based, let me rephrase. Uh, this affordability crisis uh, is situated uh, in a shift toward uh, an asset-based welfare model. Um, in fact, um, this model says that uh, real estate has become an important driver in inequalities because the flows of household real estate investments are instrumental to the dynamics of asset capitalization. That is Piketty. Uh, and uh, in the work of Piketty and the uh, work of Schwarz, Valriette, uh, Kemeny here, what is important to remember is that uh, the um, uh, housing, the assets capitalized in housing for owners is used as an investment for the future is used as an investment for retirement by households. That means that people are usually, uh, usually trust the market to, uh, to protect their investment, to protect their asset if they are property buyers, because in the same time, um, in the same time, the welfare models have been reformed everywhere in Europe. So the usual form of welfare now is for households to capitalize value in housing to invest for the older days. Um, so property value is very important because it's an investment uh, in the future. Um, at the same time, uh, increased property prices directly affect social and spatial segregation patterns of residents and buyers. There are places where prices are high and places where prices are low, and this you know uh, very well. Uh, so we usually uh, conceptualize this as, I don't know if, it's quali if it qualifies as a complex system, <laughs> but uh, we usually explain it as a system, uh, and um, a feedback loop between different uh, moments uh, at the point of exchange. Uh, what, what's happening? when a property is sold to another buyer. Um, a first moment is, at the moment of the transaction, is how much you can invest. And how much you can invest as a household is determined by the price to income ratio. The income that you have compared to the price of the property you want to buy. Um, so uh, the spatial structure of cities is structured according to variegated housing affordability. There are affordable places and places that are not affordable for a median households, for instance. 
Um, and this um, can be analyzed uh, with special temporal analysis of prices. There are places where prices go up, places where prices go down, and this is price volatility, which is very special, very special. Um, price volatility um, produces uh, the valuation of households' property assets. In short, there are winners and losers on the market. People who invested at the right place and people who invested and bought a property at the wrong place. Uh, and uh, property household asset valuation is determined by price volatility that in turn determines, determines wealth accumulation and debt vulnerability. Uh, winners accumulate wealth. Winners will capitalize on property values. Losers will be more vulnerable, more vulnerable because they are indebted to get a property but will lose value. Um, and this will, in turn, go up to where it is worth to invest and where it's not worth it to invest. Uh, this is very important for real estate development, it's very important for developers, it's very important for uh, public policies to know where are the places where investment goes and the other places. So it produces an uneven urban fabric and inequalities, special inequalities. Uh, so this is a, a self-fulfilling uh, feedback loop, but with two main uh, directions, uh, whether price go up or down. Um, um, so for the, uh, for the, the overall project, uh, our method method methodology relies on bridging together uh, data sets that have never been analyzed together. Uh, this is the example only for France. Uh, so what we are doing in Paris, Lyon, and Avignon, uh, and we put together different files. Uh, some are uh, transactions, actual transactions. Uh, they have names, we call them Bien and Perval, but never mind. These are fully disaggregated databases with latitude and longitude, and we have uh, basically millions of records with the address of the property, the latitude and longitude of the property, and we can identify sellers and buyers by social occupational categories, which is very interesting because we are able to uh, look at who, whom selling to who. Um, another series of files we are using are um, parcel data. Parcel data with, which are established for tax purpose, and with this kind of data, we, ha we will have a pretty much uh, good idea of how to describe uh, the um, um, to describe where some owners are going to invest, because we use that, we will use that to track to track um, the different investment an owner is doing everywhere in France. Let's say someone is located in Avignon, owns the property in Avignon. With this kind of file, we will know where is ha he has another property, for instance, in Paris or in Marseille, uh, therefore has multiple property. So we know where people are selling and buying, and we know who owns what. Uh, trying to, to, to put that together. Uh, we also have uh, some information, and Thibault has worked a lot on this kind of information, on the households, wealth, and assets uh, national uh, database, and also uh, another database, which is the family benefits database. It's a five million records database, and one PhD student, Luke, uh, is uh, looking at this kind of data. He's not with us uh, this week. Uh, so that's the description of the kind of data we, we are handling. So now uh, I'm moving to uh, first insights of uh, this first part of the presentation. And it's a little bit frustrating, uh, maybe, because it's only uh, preliminary results. Uh, it's, it comes from paper which is uh, currently um, uh, revised and resubmit <laughs> for a journal, but never mind. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll show you. Um, first, so with the feedback loop, the feedback loop uh, uh, give insights on the different parts of the feedback loop. 
So insight number one, inflation and volatility. Uh, for Paris, Lyon and Avignon, uh, which are three distinctive cities in the urban hierarchy in France. Um, back, to, back to this, maybe. Um, we, uh, we, we chose a capital city, uh, a medium-sized city, which is a regional center, and a, a, smaller, a smaller city in southern France. What we see on this map um, is that we have uh, places where uh, property values goes up in red and places where property values goes down uh, between uh, 2009 and 2012. So uh, needless to say that the center of Paris and the western side of Paris uh, goes up and uh, does very well. But in the outskirts of the city, uh, there are places with uh, uh, decreasing property values. Same in Lyon. The western side of Lyon are well off and going up, but some spots are going down. It's the reverse in Avignon. It's the reverse in Avignon. The city center, uh, it's a shrinking city, basically, what we call a shrinking city. The center goes down, while some of the outskirts of the city, especially to the west and the east, uh, go up uh, a little bit. So, uh, and this, um, these trends we identify, um, they uh, are characterized by an increased volatility. Um, this is interesting, I think, because this is D9 uh, over D1, uh, the interdecile ratio. And what we see is that the volatility of price has decreased between 1993 and 2008-9. This is in Lyon. But after the global financial crisis, the volatility of price has gone up and down uh, for, uh, in, 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 in this period of time. Uh, it's interesting uh, because the inflation, the inflation in property markets is not uh, regularly uh, distributed in space and, uh, and uh, volatility is going up. So we look at insight number two, affordability in terms of price to income ratio. Um, on this slide, uh, the idea is to contextualize uh, to contextualize mm -hmm. where a standard property owner, and I would say not an average, but a median property owner, would be able to buy somewhere uh, in one of the cities. So we compare, the, um, we compare between the three cities the number of monthly incomes required to buy one square meter of real estate. So uh, with the dark shades, you need more than two uh, months of income to buy one square meter, and uh, in the uh, light shades, uh, it's less than half a month to buy one square meter. Uh, this is um, uh, the local price divided by the national median income. Mm -hmm. National median income is important because the idea behind this is whether someone living anywhere in France would be able to get a property here or there. Uh, we are not interested in dividing the price by the local, local median uh, income, uh, for instance. So you have here a, a, a picture of the inequal affordability for the three cities. And next we move to the sub dimension. Because there are losers and winners, some capitalize and some don't. Uh, so we looked at um, data about the financial assets and real estate investments. Uh, this, uh, at the municipal level, is the share of financial and real estate investment revenues in total households income, uh, meaning that uh, you have the real estate investment revenues here, whether uh, some of the owners uh, uh, give their property to let uh, on the market. And uh, you can see that it's pretty much correlated with the price to income ratio with some, different, uh, some, some differences, especially in Lyon, with the west side, where you can see capitalization uh, and income from real estate uh, very much, and also in the outskirts, uh, in the outskirts of Avignon. Uh, yeah, 
Um, this slide is important because, because it shows uh, what we call um, the special fix uh, in rental and speculative real estate investment. Um, it contributes to uh, the efforts of households to offset the detrimental effect of price to income. Uh, just to make sure you understand what I'm saying. If you have assets capitalized in the property, you will be able to sell and buy another property elsewhere. So the assets capitalized in property are recycled by the market to buy another property. So this is an important picture to understand the feedback loop. Um, another proxy to discuss uh, the local accumulation of wealth and assets is, for instance, the construction, the construction dynamics and categories for investment subsidies zoning. Uh, this is, I don't know how it, how it is in Spain, but in France, um, some rental housing is heavily subsidized by the state. If you have capital, if you have assets and invest the asset in rental housing, you'll get uh, tax incentives to do so. And these are the maps where um, structures are built that are dedicated to subsidized rental housing for investors. Uh, and uh, this is another point in the feedback loop which looks, which looks at uh, the dynamics of investment by households, uh, <coughs> probably the winners. And we can see from these maps that many of the investments are located in the tensed areas, the areas where there is a tension on the housing market. Well, finally, uh, for this first part of the presentation, um, vulnerability and poverty rates of honors. I insisted there were losers and winners. So uh, some of the, th some of the, uh, of the owners are more vulnerable uh, according to where they are located uh, because they are uh, somehow located in places uh, losing property value. Uh, this is a proxy only for the moment to, to inform this feedback loop, uh, which is the poverty rates of owner-occupied households. You can see in the center of Avenue that the poverty rate has very much concentrated in the center of the city and the south of the city. Remember, the investors were to the west and the northern outskirts. In Lyon, <laughs> on the east side of the city, and in Paris, the north and east side uh, of, the, of the central part of the city. So here are for the main pictures of, this, uh, of how we inform this feedback loop. Uh, so from now, uh, I will insist on uh, maybe some methodological issues. Um, I added it because of the discussion we had with Mathias this morning. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, all the maps here have been produced at the level of the municipality. But uh, because of the uh, multi-area unit problem, the MOP problem with spatial uh, analysis, we want to work at the grid level. And the maps, some of the maps that we'll show you next uh, have been produced at the grid level. Um, so one of our idea uh, was to present uh, information on the dynamics of property values uh, that are informed at a very uh, local level of a grid instead of, uh, instead of uh, municipalities. Uh, so this map, uh, which has been published in a paper in PLOS One, um, this map shows the dynamics of uh, property prices in the outskirts of Paris, in the suburbs of Paris, for individual houses. And um, we have a problem with real estate data uh, that you may know uh, very well. They are located by X and Y, everywhere, latitude and longitude. But if we want to match them with a grid, uh, we have many empty cells. And uh, for instance, if we have, let's say, a subdivision like this, which is track housing next to one another, we have property there, 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 but we didn't have transaction for that year. We have nearby transactions. So we use uh, 
a, a smoothing technique, an interpolation technique, to uh, value the uh, squares uh, where we should have properties. We do that to evaluate a potential value and property based on an hypothesis, which is uh, the usual real estate agent hypothesis. If I need to value a property, I will go to look to the closest uh, alike property. So basically what we do is that we compute a steward potential, a steward potential of property values uh, in cells that are inhabited uh, close to, uh, in, in, uh, with a distance which is evaluated uh, by network distance through the street network. So uh, if we want to value this square, we use the street network to uh, compute the steward potential for the price. So, um, well, this is the extraction. So we come out with this map and we keep a lot of holes in, this in the map because there are woods and unpopulated area. We don't want to value places where, the, where no one is living. Uh, it makes sense. And we did that also to look at who is selling to whom. Who is selling to whom? Um, let's say, for instance, um, intermediary occupations or retired. Uh, the maps are the results of interpolation, potential interpolation. Uh, and they show um, the, uh, the <laughs> sorry, the balance, the balance between sellers and buyers from one category. So here are intermediary occupation between employees and executives uh, in the in the occupational scale in France. And what it shows that intermediary occupation are more likely to buy properties close to Paris and in, in some uh, suburban clusters like this, uh, and they are more likely to sell properties in the bluish areas. It's absolutely the reverse for retired. They are more likely to buy properties uh, in the outskirts and to sell properties to renters, to executives uh, in, the, in, in the, the more central location. So this is what we try to do to uh, characterize the property markets. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, technical and methodological issues going on with uh, estimating the number of buyers, the number of sellers of each categories, because we always have empty sales and empty, empty values. Um, so after this first, uh, this fir this first uh, 25 minutes <laughs> uh, presentation, um, I just go through uh, during the next 10 or 15 minutes, maybe, uh, through what we've done in, with, uh, with Rosé uh, and uh, Mathia and uh, Pere um, from IFISC with the Espon Big Data and Territorial Analysis and then... Sorry, I'll breathe a little bit and then... No, it's not working. Like this. Yeah, uh, so what we've been doing together for the ESPN uh, Big Data for Territorial Analysis on Housing uh, Dynamics Project uh, we, that we have conducted in eight months. That, that was a, what I like to call a quick and dirty project. We had only eight months. <laughs> uh, it's only a feasibility analysis. And I'll let you know what was the problem um, with uh, the... Uh, what we had to deliver to the European Union, to the European Commission. Uh, the idea was to, pr to produce new indicators uh, to monitor housing dynamics. Um, the project was uh, required us to go through uh, the questions of affordability, big data, and housing. Uh, ESPON wanted us to scrap data from real estate agents, for instance, to uh, inform housing conditions in different cities in Europe. Um, so, non facts, I've discussed that already, but one of the major issues uh, is that everywhere in Europe, the problem is almost the same. Uh, 25 states of OECD promote home ownership. Um, uh, a lot of disposable income uh, is spent on housing, and the prices uh, of real estate goes higher uh, than uh, income. 
we covered first the statistics that were available at uh, the European level. And more or less, all the statistics from uh, OECD and from Eurostat uh, that were available were only at a country level, at a country level, not at a local level. So the uh, policy question uh, that was asked by Espan was how to inform the unequal un affordability gap in different cities to compare between neighborhoods and across, uh, across neighborhoods. Uh, and they wanted detailed information. So I'll stay on that slide a little bit uh, because this is the very core of what we've done together. We had in some countries, and countries were Poland, Switzerland, France, and Spain. We had in some places conventional data public conventional census data, for instance, on income. We had unconventional institutional data, real estate transaction database, when available. We call them unconventional institutional data because transactions, they come from instance from the chamber of the notaries, the one you've seen earlier. But, but they were not designed to study affordability. They are designed to do pricing of housing uh, for the market. So it's unconventional because we're not using them the way they were designed to. Unconventional harvested big data sources on real estate websites. And so these are the different sources that we had uh, from uh, different uh, origins. Institutional data, scrap data uh, from websites, and we wanted to bring all this data together in the same uh, conceptual framework to analyze uh, affordability in Europe. Um, we need to produce harmonized indicator, indicators at several scales, such as price to income ratio, uh, to produce maps of price for ownership and rental, and uh, we had to produce the data for different geographical level. Um, so the overall process uh, was for the whole project to identify relevant data, source, data sources country by country. And it requires a local, uh, a, a local knowledge of the available information. Second, data collection and data cleaning. Um, this requires data harvesting, database access, uh, negotiating the cost of accessing institutional database. Data aggregation and the production of indicators. And then, at the end, uh, data sources combination. How to compare uh, the data together. Um, data harvesting. Uh, so on your side, at IFISC, you used Photocast. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, in Poland, uh, the team used Domiporta, which was uh, another website, and in France, Marc uh, <laughs> used Le Bon Coin, Le Bon Coin, which is a, a, a platform, an advertisement platform, where um, rental and, um, and um, uh, owner's property are uh, advertised. From the s different platforms that we used, uh, we extracted um, to produce harmonized indicators, uh, the number of transactions, the surface of properties, uh, the number of rooms, the price paid, uh, <coughs> advertised price per square meter, and we produced variables which are time required to buy one square meter and time required to rent one square, met one square meter according to income. Um, one of the main issues uh, we had to go through, because Paris is not Barcelona, is not Krakow, is not Woosh, and it's very hard to compare uh, cities together. Uh, we wanted to go through uh, spatial harmonization um, and uh, make sure we would be able to inform different cities the same way. 
Uh, to do spatial harmonization, we use the potential, uh, the potential interpolation, two-word interpolation, uh, and we did it for, uh, for instance, here a one-kilometer uh, span, a two-kilometer span, or a five-kilometer span, and we had for every series to choose what was the right span to produce the uh, potential potential price, the Stewart uh, price. Um, uh, the results from this study are um, different maps, a series of 50 maps uh, that we've produced for SPAN, and um, I'll cover some of them to give you an idea of the variegated maps and, and indicators we've produced uh, with the methodology. Uh, well, this is very standard. This is a map of the average price for real estate property uh, at the border between France and Switzerland. Uh, Geneva, Almas, Annecy are the main cities located here. And you can see on this map the places where the prices are very high and where the prices are lower. So uh, with this kind of methodology of, of interpolated visualization, we're able to uh, visually compare um, a cross-border area and an area like Paris, uh, for, this instance, for this case, for instance, for apartments in 2011-2012, uh, the map of uh, property prices uh, for apartments. Uh, we extended the work towards a series of maps to compare the evolution of prices in different cities. And for instance, this map shows the case of Avignon that you already know from the former presentation uh, with property prices going down in the center and going up between 2010 and 2014 in some areas. Um, so the three maps here have been done with con institutional non-conventional data, meaning We've done that with actual transaction. And one of the goals of the study was to compare what we got from actual transactions from what we got from advertised prices uh, on real on, uh, platforms, on internet platforms. Um, this is a map of uh, Barcelona, I think. <laughs> uh, Barcelona um, for the advertised uh, price. And uh, another map for the advertised price in uh, in Varsovi, Wuch, and Krakow uh, in Poland. Warsaw, Wuch, and Krakow. Um, and the idea was to use wherever, wherever um, uh, institutional data were not available, uh, advertise prices as a proxy to uh, analyze uh, the markets. Um, One of the main goals of the, of, of the project, real quick, was to allow to compare between cities. Um, and uh, for instance, the maps here for Vassal, Wood, Krakow, for Madrid, for Barcelona, and Palma are all based on the same indicator. These are maps of affordability, meaning the number of months you, of income you need to buy or rent one square meter. Uh, for every city in the sample, uh, we computed the affordability index using the advertised price we got from the internet and the median national income, same idea. To what extent someone living anywhere in Poland will be able to purchase a property in Warsaw, uh, for instance. So we did that at the municipal level. We did that at the municipal level because uh, to some extent there are limits in data availability and institutional data such as income are available only at the municipal level uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we can see for instance uh, that in Versailles you need more than 2.8 months uh, of full national income uh, to buy one square meter, more than 2-4 months in Madrid and uh, well in Palma Heard in other words, it's very, very <laughs> uh, expensive. Um, same here in Paris, uh, Geneva, and Avignon. 
Uh, well, Paris is a record. You need more than like five months of income to uh, buy uh, what for a matter. Um, three, six months in Swiss. If you're Swiss, it's 3.6 months. If you're French, it's 6.8 <laughs> months, depending on your nationality. And, uh, and in Avignon, it's very, very cheap, actually. We should go all go there uh, to find housing. Um, uh, from this, and I think I'll finish my presentation on that. Um, it's very nice to mix data together from different origins and to find pathways and methodology uh, to uh, bridge data sets together that were not designed to do so, and I insist that was the main, of the st main goal of the study. So uh, we're not trying to s look at what happens if we match together data sets from Airbnb and data sets from, uh, from a real estate offer. Um, so uh, this is, for instance, the Airbnb impact on real estate offer. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a mathematician, so uh, this is rough, <laughs> but um, L squared is 0 0.8. Um, it shows something very interesting. Uh, to what extent can you derive the density of Airbnb offer compared to the density of a real estate offer? Um, if the market is very active on the internet platforms, if there are places where there are a lot of properties advertised, to what extent are there only, are there only also the places where there are a lot of Airbnb property advertised? Well, it works pretty well. The two maps are roughly similar. One thing that would be interesting to dive into, uh, and this is, one more time, a caveat, rough and dirty, but uh, to give you an idea of, of the issue, is that if we plot, if we map the residuals of the linear model, we have an idea of where the pressure of Airbnb is situated on the market. So we're not trying to explain the price, the property prices with Airbnb. We're trying to compare the pressure on the market produced by uh, Airbnb, which is very different. And uh, around Sagrada Familia quarter, around La Rambla, you have a quarter with a very high pressure, meaning that the, uh, uh, the, uh, these quarters are located uh, in the, in the uh, location of positive residuals. You have negative residuals in these areas, in the rest of Barcelona, meaning that uh, Airbnb market does not put as much pressure uh, on property markets in this area. We can do the same in Paris. And in Paris, the pressure of Airbnb, uh, meaning the residual of the regression, uh, are located in the right bank of the Seine River, north of Notre Dame, Le Marais, first, second, third uh, district, and Montmartre. Well, whereas on the Airbnb map, you have Airbnbs all around Paris. But this helps to locate where the actual uh, pressure is. Uh, Madrid uh, around Plaza Mayo. So uh, main findings uh, from this uh, eight month study uh, for Spam uh, is that we inform at a European level for several for a set of cities, for a set of cities, the increased and unequal affordability gap. We inform how housing costs exacerbate differences, inequalities and segregation. Um, uh, if we go into details, uh, I'd like to add that inflation has been ubiquitous during the last two decades, but the hierarchy of neighborhood has been maintained uh, and extended to the inner suburbs. In almost every city, except Avignon and Wuch, which are the uh, shrinking cities of our set of cities, in the rest of the cities, the hierarchy of neighborhood, neighborhoods has been maintained and extend it to the inner suburbs. This hierarchization leads to strong, selective, filtered ownership access by income, no constraint also in the inner ring of the regions. For instance, we identified in many former blue-collar neighborhoods. So yes, this is basically gentrification. 
Um, and the other important fi finding is that the process, processes of gentrification and touristification are preeminent, but many other factors can be highlighted uh, because we have very different cities with Paris, Krakow, etc. And uh, we also need to look at the complexity of facts such as the local urban dynamics and growth, local contingencies in the structures of sub-markets. Uh, the, the ap apartment sub-markets are not the same in Avenue and in Paris, for instance. And uh, there is also a very strong effect that needs to be uh, scrutinized, which are the effects of how the investments are driven by public policies and uh, everywhere uh, ordinary financialization, meaning what I started with, uh, the asset-based welfare. Well, I think uh, that's it uh, for the moment, if we want to keep 15 minutes for questions. Um, and I hope you have uh, <laughs> an overview of what we are doing with property data. Uh, just out of curiosity, I know that it's very demanding, but uh, is there any possibility to extend your research, uh, let's say, very fast, far in the past, like uh, uh, what you have shown us uh, before uh, for Palma and Barcelona or Paris, uh, but from the 60s, let's say? Uh, the, 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 the quick answer would be no. <laughs> uh, the, the, real, the actual answer is that if you're using transactions, for instance, uh, ah, okay, there are no, no register transaction of yeah. uh, the House of Notre No, you have nothing before 1996. Okay. So basically, the animated map I showed you, uh, the green and the uh, yeah, green. Exactly. And the, uh, I was yeah. curious about that. Yeah. Uh, was 1996, 2012. Uh, we can extend to 2018. We're going to have the data. It's not possible to go uh, beyond 1996 because uh, there was no computer records of transaction at that time in France uh, for the chamber of the notaries. Uh, I mean, if you're using scrap data, it's an evidence that you're not going to go backwards, uh, neither. Uh, the only thing you can do is to use institutional data, census data, to have a sense of the valuation of properties. Uh, it's possible, for instance, in the US to go back to the 70s, because the census was very well designed to do so. Uh, but uh, it's not possible in France, for instance, to go beyond 1980 uh, with censuses. So I hope it answers the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, like, uh, I was curious about one of the plots in the first part of the presentation. Yes. Like, uh, I don't understand what is the, the vulnerability in quantitative terms and what is the poverty rate? Oh, um, yeah, I, I can go back to that slide. Um, the yeah, I assume that was a lot of information in 45 minutes too, so. <laughs> um, vulnerability, um, let's put it, there are two different vulnerabilities for households. Oops, <laughs> merci Julien. <laughs> um, there it is. Um, there are two, so two kinds of vulnerability for households. One vulnerability, is for households who bought property uh, with a credit. Uh, so um, the level of debt they have uh, well is uh, very much connected to the income they had at the moment of the transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, if the uh, value of the property goes down, uh, they will lose value, they will lose assets in their investment. Um, that's uh, negative assets somehow. Uh, and it, they become vulnerable because they are not going to be able to resell the property and move elsewhere. They will be trapped in location. Uh, with, so it's one sort of uh, vulnerability. And one prox we don't know the depth of households. It's very hard to know the depth of households. So one way to do that is to uh, switch to a proxy, which is the poverty rates of owner-occupied households, uh, which means that uh, they are they hold a property, but they are below the property rate, the poverty rate threshold, meaning that there are high, high probability that they are vulnerable on the market. Low, 
low price properties with, with low values on the market and trapped in place. So I hope it clarifies a little bit, but the, the idea is to, to show that owners can be poor too. <laughs> they can be vulnerable. There are winners and losers on the markets. Uh, those that are included and can go forward and buy another property, and those who are left aside, set aside uh, by the market uh, with debt, usually. But shouldn't we expect in the very center of Paris that there were no poverty rates? Because I expect that the price is incredibly high there. So if you live there, you have a, a transfer for the formula fact of uh, living there. Yeah, you, you mean you're surprised by, by, by the poverty rate in downtown Paris? In the very center. In the very center, yeah. Very, very low. Yeah, very low. Uh, below 5.3%. Yeah, for instance. Um, um, yeah, it's it's surprising because uh, there are a lot of poor people living down in Paris. <laughs> yeah. um, the, I, I, I would be um, um, first the thresholds that you see are uh, average, mean, and standard deviation. Okay, so uh, you are below one standard deviation in Paris um, compared to Avignon and Lyon, compared, uh, which means that you have very high poverty rates. Uh, which are very clustered in the north east of Paris on Denton Avignon. First, second, there are poor people in Paris. Uh, they are living in some very small apartments, etc. Uh, they are not owners. Um, okay. It's poverty rates of owners. Poor people in Paris are mostly renters. Okay. Mostly renters, um, and uh, the structure of ownership in Paris is such that if you are poor in Paris owning an apartment, you have very high incentives to sell your property uh, so that you're not going to be poor anymore. If, you sell, if you're a poor household and own a property in Paris, if you sell it, you're a millionaire, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so just sell your property. And this is what happened. And it happened during the two, uh, between 1990 and 2010, uh, the middle class and lower middle class was selling properties uh, to make profit of inflation and to and to buy properties as well. So this is this explains why the rates of owner by the households in Paris is pretty low. I hope it's okay. <laughs> more or less clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there was a plot in the beginning. <coughs> Uh, a red and blue map of Paris, I think, was related to the prices. Yeah, that, that one. Yeah, the one before. This one? No, the other. The map. The map. Yeah. yeah. So this explains to you how much the how the prices changed during these years. Uh, yeah, uh, this map uh, uh, is a comparison uh, the uh, rate of growth or rate of decline of price uh, of apartments. Uh, apartments in Paris, Avignon, and, and Lyon. So uh, it's we we did we made the map simple uh, by purpose. Uh, we wanted just to explain that in some places in yellow and red prices are increasing. Uh, in red prices are increasing very fast, more than 3.5 yeah. percent a year, and in blue areas prices are declining. Do you try to correlate this with the local income? Um, you can create it with local income, but the best uh, we felt the best way to create it was to with uh, median income okay. to, to do the affordability yeah. map. Uh, if you create it with local income, uh, it will probably give roughly the same um, the highest local income being located in that area mm -hmm. in Paris. So uh, yeah, this is why I mean, uh, I mean higher higher income are in the winning areas. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is tricky because basically it tells you that probably the people that could not afford living there were kicked out of the center of the city. No. Uh, people who could not afford to, li to live there were have been kicked off during the last two decades, yeah. uh, roughly. Uh, and it is true that uh, people living in these kind of areas can and only the property in these kind of areas can afford. A property almost everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. This is related maybe to the, the other part you show in the end, like about the uh, retiree. 
the they are selling their properties in the middle, in the, in the, in the rental. city, and they are going out in the, like, in the... Yeah, absolutely. And some of them are investing in rental yeah. at the same time, in different places in France, not only in Paris. Or yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have one question on the no data voices. Voices where there is no data. Ah, well, uh, because it's it's a, it's a, yeah, this is apartments only. Uh, in some cases, we have to make a difference between apartments and houses. Oh. So this map is no, there, no, there is no, no apartment in this kind of area. These are rural areas, but you have individual houses. So uh, this is the reason why uh, we mapped separately apartments. Mm. And for instance, the, 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 the animated map, which was for individual houses, okay. uh, suburban houses, and you have information for the outskirts. But you need to treat the two, uh, the two uh, subsets uh, differently. And what happens in the region where you or in the areas, all the areas where both coexist? Do you see, um, uh, for instance, uh, places where there is a declining of one of the prices or increasing of the other one? Or it's so possible. People switching from one. It, it's possible, and uh, I would uh, say the answer would be probably a Thibault's answer. Uh, <laughs> because if you compare in the same place, um, uh, Thibault has just finished a PhD and the, sub the topic was the property regimes, the local property regimes uh, in Paris. And if you switch from one kind of a property to another kind of property, you're switching to one regime mm -hmm. to another regime. Uh, it's not the same of owning an apartment in a city and, and a, a house in the s at the same place. Uh, and uh, they're not, they do not belong to the same market segments, mm -hmm. to, 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 to say it uh, rapidly. Um, and it's very often, it's very often uh, that uh, where you have new structures built, and new structures are mostly in Paris apartment complexes, mm -hmm. where you have new structures built with brand new apartments, um, the uh, stock of older individual housing uh, lose prices or uh, is. Um, uh, a, li a little bit um, dec decreases dec 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 decreases on the market, relatively speaking. Relatively speaking, mm -hmm. price goes up, but not at the same rate. <laughs> uh, and you have a disconnection between the price trajectories uh, because of uh, mostly the um, uh, the I'm looking for the word um, older property are deprecated. Yeah, yeah basically. And they, they, they do not correspond to the same market segments. Yeah, mm. 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 question, yes, uh, this is sort of maybe a bit of a mean question. So, um, so this data is obviously sort of of interest to I don't know, local city councils, politicians, uh, local authorities, right? So why have they not done this analysis? So <laughs> why, why do they leave this? <laughs> so I don't understand that. So either they can't do it, or they, they can't be bothered to do it, or they don't have enough time. Well, uh, I, 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 I don't know. Um, uh, basically, uh, we do that uh, and we collaborate with the uh, Planning Authority of Paris, of Avenue and Lyon. Uh, we had interest for the study by, by the city of Bordeaux, for instance. And Espen required a, a comparative study for, for his new approach. So you're right. Uh, local so government. don't have the, the, the you know, French civil service or whatever the economy don't have the resources to they, they don't through. have the resources they, they, they never put the data together that way uh, actually yeah the, the answer is they don't, they don't put the data together that way and usually transaction transactions data are used to explain price as a dependent variable and this is the main uh, the main uh, research strategy that has been conducted in many cities so uh, what we're doing is we try to give <coughs> the perspective as a we don't explain prices. Julien, you, you need to have also bear in mind that the data that we use is mostly proprietary data uh, that was bought for uh, research programs. So mm. Public institutions don't even have the access to transactions data in the first place. Yeah, they, they have to buy from they have to yeah, buy transactions. Buy so quite expensive. To buy actual transactions, it was very expensive for us. Mm. And for a city, they usually buy uh, some yeah, they extract. They buy from using public money. Ab 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 absolutely. <laughs> 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 
And, and this, this is why there is a, a new industry coming uh, now, um, everywhere, and Julien, Julien will, discuss it, will discuss this, uh, and this is what we discussed this morning. Um, you have on this map different sets of data. Bien is a proprietary database we purchased from the notaries. It's very structured. But DVF, DVF for Lyon and Avignon is different. It's a parcel-based data. It's, uh, now it's distributed open source. So you can, you can just download the database on the internet. But there is a problem with this database. It, requir it requires a lot of skills to use it properly because you don't have transactions. So you don't have price. You have, um, for instance, if a building is sold, you'll have the value for the whole building mm -hmm. and you will need to uh, disconnect every apartment row by row uh, to uh, compute the actual price of every single apartment. Mm -hmm. So uh, this database requires a lot of post-processing and local governments don't have the skills and knowledge to do that by themselves. So there are uh, agencies that sell the transformed data to local governments and there are also companies um, and uh, Julien said a word about that this morning uh, there are companies that make a specialty to uh, analyze and sell property data to local governments, to agencies, to uh, real estate agents, etc. And they are actually making a lot of money. <laughs> okay, any other question? If not, uh, let's thank you. Thank you for listening. I leave tomorrow, but the team will be there, so feel free to ask them questions. So you, you want to, yeah. And they'll get the answer. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. This room is warm. <laughs> this room is warm. <laughs> yeah.